Hello everyone, you are watching the first part in the fourth video of a Bible study video series. I'm Dine, and I would like to start this video off with a quick prayer, and then after that we will get into Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to uh, read your Bible and understand, to read your word and understand what your word is saying. Please use this time that we're spending for your glory and, if possible, for your kingdom. And thank you. Amen. Before we get into this section, I want to go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, and try to explain it, which I forgot to do in the last video. It says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Obviously, Adam and Eve did not die as soon as they ate the fruit. Instead, they became outcasts. In fact, Adam died, as mentioned in Genesis chapter 5, after living almost a thousand years. So, what did God mean when he said they would die in the day that they ate the fruit? Well, the Hebrew word translated as die doesn't give any clues. But, the Hebrew word translated day does, a little bit. This word isn't always strictly used for a daytime or a span of 24 hours. Strong says this about the word. A day, as the warm hours, whether literal, from sunrise to sunset, or from one sunset to the next, or figurative, a space of time defined by an associated term. Some people think that Adam and Eve died when they ate the fruit because their connection with their Maker, who provided for all their needs, was broken. Whether that's completely true or not, this is true. Before they ate the fruit, Adam and Eve were most likely immortal but afterwards their death became inevitable. So either way you look at it, they died, or began to die, the moment that they ate the fruit. Verse 1 begins, And the man knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man with the help of Jehovah. And again she bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. According to Strong, Cain's name means a lance, but is usually connected to another similar word that means to obtain or to possess. Abel's name means vain. The names Cain and Abel may not be the original names of the two brothers. Both of their names may have been changed because of what happened later in their lives. Although, another possibility is that Cain's name is original, but Abel's name was not. Maybe the meaning of Lance was given to Cain because he was the firstborn, but the similarity between Cain's name and another word that means to obtain things was later realized. My guess is that whether Cain was the firstborn's original name or not, the secondborn was given the name Abel, which means vain, after his death as a sign of mourning. Verse 3 continues in the next paragraph. And in the process of time it came to pass, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Jehovah. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offerings, offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. According to the KJV 2003 Project footnotes, verse 3 could be translated as, And at the end of days it came to pass, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Jehovah. Maybe the two brothers decided to settle their differences by seeing who God looked on more favorably. Maybe their father suggested an offering, so that God would be pleased with his only two sons at that time. 
Maybe similar events had already happened before, and that's why Cain was so angry this time. Along the same lines, maybe this took place on the Sabbath, the seventh day, so their offerings were a common event. Easton suggested this in his dictionary, saying, It came to pass, in process of time, margin, at the end of days, i.e., probably on the Sabbath, that the two brothers presented their offerings to the Lord. According to Strong, the word translated as offering in verses 3 and 4 usually meant an offering that was, quote, bloodless and voluntary. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he had witness borne to him that he was righteous, God bearing witness in respect of his gifts, and through it he being dead yet speaketh. There's probably a reason why it simply says that Cain, quote, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Jehovah, but Abel, quote, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Abel wanted to please God by bringing the best, but Cain doesn't seem to share as much of that desire. By the way, the word also probably just means that he also brought an offering, Abel, not Cain. Not necessarily that his offering was the same in amount, quality, or kind. Strong says that the word translated as respect in verses 4 and 5 means, quote, to gaze at or about, properly for help, and can imply inspection or consideration. In other words, what verses 4 and 5 are saying is that God gave Abel's offering attention, but not Cain's. The word translated in verse 5, and also in verse 6, which is not on the screen at the moment, as wrath means to, quote, glow or grow warm, unquote, and can mean to grow angry or to be jealous. Maybe one of the reasons Cain was angry was because he thought that he should hold more authority and importance than his younger brother. Maybe another reason Cain was angry is because he thought that God would honor his work and the offering that came from that work because it was the same kind of work God had originally set for Adam to do in the Garden of Eden. Maybe his reasoning for following after his father's lead in occupation was mostly to gain respect and honor, which is not what God gave him for his offering. Verse 6 begins a new paragraph. And Jehovah said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall it not be lifted up? And if thou doest not well, sin coucheth at the door, and unto thee shall be its desire, but do thou rule over it. And then verse 8 continues into another paragraph. And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. Young translates verse 7 like this, Is there not, if thou dost well, acceptance? And if thou dost not well, at the opening a sin offering is crouching, and unto thee its desire, and thou rulest over it. If you compare the American Standard Version with Young's literal translation, I think maybe this verse should be read between the two like this, Is there not, if thou dost well, acceptance? And if thou dost not well, sin croucheth at the door, and unto thee shall be its desire, and thou rulest over it. I'm not completely sure about what verses 6 and 7 mean. I think it means that God told Cain that if he was sincere towards God, does well, then his offering would be accepted, lifted up. But if he wasn't sincere towards God, or maybe just didn't do well in general, maybe by not loving God, then sin was lying in wait at the door, wanting to take him, even though he was in control of his actions, and therefore his sin. 
This is what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. For this is the message which he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain was of the evil one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his works were evil, and his brothers righteous. Marvel not, brethren, if the world hateth you. The main reason Cain killed Abel was because of their differences. Abel had a sincere desire to please God, Cain didn't. Cain was evil, and Abel was good. Young translated verse 8 like this, And Cain saith unto Abel his brother, Let us go into the field. And it cometh to pass, in their being in the field, that Cain riseth up against Abel his brother, and slayeth him. I think the Hebrew text says that Cain told something to Abel, but doesn't say what he said. That's probably why Young puts Cain's words in italics, and also why other translations just don't include them. Young thinks that Cain must have said something like what Young translated it as, but in actuality it's not in the Hebrew text. Verse 9 continues in a new paragraph. And Jehovah said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now, cursed art thou from the ground, which hath opened its mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee its strength. A fugitive and a wanderer shalt thou be in the earth. The word translated as keeper in verse 9 basically means protect, and is the same word used in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, when it says that God placed the man into the Garden of Eden. Because Cain slew his brother, the same earth that received his brother's blood would not allow him to grow things anymore, whether at all or just very little, I don't know. Verse 13 begins a new paragraph. And Cain said unto Jehovah, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the ground, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth, and it will come to pass that whosoever findeth me will slay me. And Jehovah said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Jehovah appointed a sign for Cain, lest any finding him should smite him. The American Standard Footnotes suggests verse 13 could be translated this way, or should be. And Cain said unto Jehovah, Mine iniquity is greater than can be forgiven. Strong's dic Hebrew Dictionary says that the word translated in verse 14 as driven out means, quote, to drive out from a possession, especially to expatriate or divorce. In case you don't know, the word expatriate means to be thrown out of your homeland or fatherland. The word translated twice as face in verse 14 is the same word that's translated as presence in verse 16. According to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, this word has different meanings, one of them being a face, another countenance, another is favor, and another is presence. Moving on to verse 15, I don't know what the sign Jehovah appointed for Cain was. The King James Version translates it as a mark, and Young translates it as a token. I think I remember hearing that a game, and or a movie, had a plot in which Cain was the first vampire in the world. My guess is the idea came from this verse, and the assumption is that Cain's mark, according to the King James Version, was the mark of the beast, probably thought of as Satan's mark by the creators of the plot. Well, to put a wooden stake in that idea, Young says, 
2 cane and the ASV says 4 cane. Going deeper, the LXX translates the same word that the ASV translates as sign as semion, which, according to Strong, can mean, quote, an indication, especially ceremonially or supernaturally, and can mean a miracle, a sign, a token, or a wonder. Finally, Strong says that the Hebrew word itself means, quote, a signal, literally or figuratively before he gives some possible meanings. Maybe Cain was given some sort of appearance, like a mark on his forehead, or maybe something more miraculous, like light, that would warn others that he was protected by God. On the other hand, Easton suggests in his dictionary that Cain may have been given a personal sign from God that he would be avenged if he was killed. No matter what the sign was, it doesn't seem to be directly related to the mark of the beast. So with that, now you can rest assured that Cain was not a vampire. You're welcome. Alright, so with that, that is the end of this video. Thanks for watching, everyone.